All right. So tonight is our, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, tonight is our second Sunday essential. It's the second Sunday of the month, and so uh, tonight we're going to have another lesson from this fundamental elements of Christianity. We have several people, uh, several members that are new to the faith, and so this is one of the ways that we decided that we want to try to help educate uh, our new converts, uh, those that are new, as well as remind many of us of some things that perhaps we haven't talked about in a while. So as I've said each time, we're going to be looking at various things. We looked at the Bible timeline, the Bible books, personalities, uh, places and cultures, and tonight we're going to look at church history. Let's just be honest, how many of you absolutely loathe, just can't stand history? So I got one, two, three, all right, good. How many of you like history? Good. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry for those of you that don't like history. I apologize. You can go to sleep now because it's going to be a long 30 or 40 minutes, okay? <laughs> a lot of information because this isn't a whole lot of Bible, but it's going to answer a lot of questions. And as I've said in the past with these lessons, we will get into some other things coming up soon with inspiration and, and all kinds of other doctrines that we're going to talk about. So in church history, we're going to look at how the church developed in the last 2,000 years. 2,000 years of history, y'all, in 30 minutes, okay? Can I do it? I don't know. We're going to do the best we can. But we're going to also talk about the origin of denominations because that plays into where we are today in the United States, as well as the Church of Christ roots in the United States. So what is church history? Well, it really depends on who you're asking, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. I've got several books on church history in my library, and they all say very different things. So it depends on who you're asking. If you ask a Catholic about church history, you're going to get a very different answer than if you ask somebody who is of the Methodist faith. That's the same way if you talk to somebody who is more secular. Uh, they're going to have a very different viewpoint of church history. So history is very subjective. And sometimes it can be very biased and even uh, dishonest if you have dishonest individuals. I found that out down in Paraguay. Uh, you look at Paraguay and Argentina and Brazil, and they all talk about this time period in the 1800s when there was this big war. And depending on which side of the war you're on, that's how the history was written. It's very fascinating to see how people would approach it. Same way with church history. People approach it differently, and so it's hard to really understand uh, exactly what took place. But there's a really good book. I wish I had put a picture on here, but it's by uh, Maddox, and it's called The Eternal Kingdom. It's a member of the Lord's Church who wrote this book that explains very, very well all the history of the church up to today. And then questions that come up a lot of times are things like, did Alexander Campbell, some of you might have heard that name, we'll talk about him in just a minute, did he or Barton Stone, did they start the Church of Christ? Because that's what some people will tell you. The Church of Christ started back in the 1830s, 1840s by Alexander Campbell. In fact, you folks are Campbellites. That's, uh, you'll hear that uh, to some, some folks of other, other religious beliefs. And so then there's others who'll say, well, really, the Church of Christ didn't really get started until 1906 in that census. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And then uh, there is also, you may not realize, there are origins. We have connections with the Christian church, the disciples of Christ, and then, of course, the churches of Christ. And then why are there churches of Christ that are different? You go down the road right here in our own county, and you will encounter different beliefs and practices of different churches of Christ. You go to other parts of the country, and again, very different. So I hope I can give you a nice synopsis, and that is all I can do, is just give you a synopsis, basically some bullet points of church history. Now, one of the ways that has helped me to really understand church history is by breaking it up into six different periods. Very simple. If you know a few of the main points of church history, it's easy to break it up. There is what's called the apostolic church. I'll explain what the timelines are for each of these. There's the apostolic church, the one we just read about in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2 here, that continued up till you get into the persecuted church. And then that led into what I call the imperial church period, 
And then you go into the medieval church period. That's then followed by the Reformation church period. And then finally, what we're in now, what's known as the Restoration church period. Those are the six periods that helps me to at least identify what I'm talk, where, where I am whenever I'm thinking about church history. And each one of those is very, very important and has their distinct characteristics. So that's what we're going to look at, six different periods. That first period being the apostolic church period. This is the, from the ascension of Christ, whenever he ascended back to his throne, and here in Acts chapter 2, it began up till the death of the last apostle, John the Apostle. So that's the time frame you're looking at, about 100 A.D., from 30 A.D. to 100 A.D. Now, the characteristics of the church is what we read in the Bible. And you see many different things. For example, it was directed by the apostles. And then you see the elders come in and as, as set up in churches, as Paul says. And then you have uh, baptism for salvation. You have the doctrine of uh, the leadership, I should say, of an eldership, which you have elders, bishops, pastors are all the same thing. Those mean exactly the same thing. That's the way it's used in 1 Peter chapter 5 and so many other passages Whenever, for example, Paul says he writes to the, to the bishops and the deacons in Philippi, for example. He, he's talking to the elders. It was all understood. In the worship, you had uh, them worshiping in houses. They also worshiped in synagogues. Um, they were not, in the beginning, they were not recognized as being any different than the Jews or Judaism. The Romans just thought it was just another branch of the Jews because you had all these different sects of the Jews. And so <clears throat> they did start to encounter, however, difficulty with Roman emperor worship. There was worship that was demanded by the emperor, uh, and so that was causing some problems for the new Christians. Uh, they were more persecuted by the Jews than anybody else. And then we also see in that first church period that the New Testament canon, the books were already being gathered together by the churches. They had a full collection just like we have. There's a historian, Eusebius, and several others that went around, and they named off the books that these churches had, and it was almost identical to what we have today. Just a couple of variations here and there. So then that leads us into, <clears throat> leads us into well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, during this period, is the apostolic period, one of the things that we don't talk about much is the traditional deaths of the apostles. We don't know for a fact a lot of these apostles, how they died, but their traditional deaths are that they were either crucified, like Peter, for example, is said to be crucified upside down on a cross. They were stoned to death. They were beheaded. In fact, there's a story that one of the apostles, <clears throat> when he was about to be beheaded, the person who was going to do the execution was converted to Christ and wound up kneeling down beside the apostle and was beheaded at the same time, as well as uh, they being flayed alive and speared to death. Very fascinating uh, part of history to study. This time period also has several historians, uh, Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny. You've heard me mention them in sermons recently. But they, those are very important people in this time frame that talk about Christ, talk about uh, Christianity and everything that are not, they don't have anything to do with the Bible. It's just part of our understanding. So then we move into the next period. The next period is the persecuted church period. And I wish we had time to spend a lot more time on this one, but we just, we got to keep moving because there's so much more that we got to get to in the next few periods. But this goes from the death of, of John the Apostle up to the Edict of Milan or the Edict of Constantine. We'll talk about that more in just a second, but that was the ending of persecution. So during this time frame for 200-something years, the church was persecuted. And so they were driven underground and worshipped. They worshipped in the catacombs, and uh, they were not out openly out in the public because uh, they were misunderstood a lot of people said, you know, they're always talking about this other king. And so Rome didn't take too kindly to that. So they were always considered to be disloyal and conspiring. A lot of mis, uh, misunderstandings and myths and beliefs. For example, they believe, uh, people would say that they were incestuous because they're always talking about their brothers and their sisters. And brothers and sisters are married and stuff. And uh, 
They didn't understand the, the language that we use. Or they drink blood and eat flesh. They were cannibals. And so it was very strange. And a lot of myths and disbeliefs about Christians were uh, spread. But during this time also, you start to see some of the, the cults, the, the worship of these pagan religions, starting to cause confusion for Christians. And they start to integrate and start to think of the Virgin Mary as being more important than what the Bible makes her out to be. And that comes into play a few hundred years down the road, as well as the baby Jesus. And then you have lots of different sects and heresies that start to rise up as people are just as Paul said would happen, just as Jesus said would happen in the as time goes on that you'd have these false prophets come in, and that's exactly what happened. During this time, you still have the plurality of elderships in the churches. The churches still operated the way Margaret Street does, for example. But what started to happen is during this time, you had one of those elders start to become the head elder, and they started applying the name bishop to him. So It'd be like if we have our elders, you know, Philip and Rick and Joe, and let's just pick on Joe and say that he becomes the head elder, we're going to start calling him Bishop Wilson. Well, Bishop Wilson then would be put in charge of not only Margaret Street, but also the J Church of Christ because they don't have any elders. Uh, maybe these other congregations that don't have elders, and even some that did because they asked, and they become this regional head so it's starting to already creep into the church within, uh, right after the death of the first apostle. You also have, um, again, all the books of the Bible at this time have been completely established. We know exactly who and uh, what we have in the New Testament. And this is also the time that you hear of what's known as the church fathers. Wish we had time to go into that. Clement, Ignacio, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, and Irenaeus in origin. Uh, very, very important people. Uh, as far as their writings and things like that. Wish we could say more about that, but time's just not going to allow. We then move into the third period, and this third period is the end of persecution. And it's that Edict of Milan, whenever uh, Emperor Constantine becomes the first Christian emperor of Rome, and he decides to put an end to the persecution, writes this edict, and that stops. But what happens is, as a negative effect on the church. What winds up happening is the leadership of the church, the, is, is the doctrine is overtaken and begins to be directed by councils, ecumenical councils. And the Roman emperor, he gets involved in the church and starts making decisions for the church. And what we'll see is then a single bishop is put over these churches officially. So before it was just kind of like people were asking and doing it kind of out of necessity now, they've been officially named as head bishop over certain regional congregation, uh, regions of congregations. And then you also see the organizational structure of the church begin to mimic that of the Roman Empire. So imagine we have the way the church is set up here today, like in Margaret Street and several other congregations around. Imagine if the government were to come in and say, okay, you guys have to have a president, you have to have a Congress, and you have to have a judicial system, just like our government. And they start appointing people into these positions. That's what happened, essentially, with the church around 300 A.D. The other thing that happened is because now you have Christianity as the official religion of the ruling power with Constantine. Well, these pagan temples that used to be used for other gods, well, we're going to take those over and turn those into churches. And that's where you get this idea of these big, massive churches start to be built because they just take over these beautiful temples that were for pagans and now being used for the worship of God. This is also when they start to add things like vestments, rules about Easter, all the different ritualism and pomp and flair that you see uh, taking place in a lot of different worship types today. That's where that began, and that's also where the worship of saints was introduced during this time frame. Now, this Constantine is a very, very important person in church history. He's the first, as I mentioned, the first Christian, Christian um, uh, leader of the world. He's an emperor of Rome, <coughs> and he assumed control and presided over the church by calling the emperor. 
calls the first meeting. He basically says, all right, I'm tired of all this arguing that y'all do and everything else. Now that we have Christianity is going to be the official religion, I want Margaret Street, I want Jay, I want Avalon, I want uh, uh, West Milton, I want everybody. I want you guys to meet right over here at, let's just pick a place. We're all going to go to Tallahassee and we're going to have a meeting. So the, the, the emperor calls a meeting of the church and sets up this first ecumenical council, which was the Council of Nicaea in 325, and basically runs the thing and says how things are going to be. We'll talk about that more in just one second. Another last interesting thing about Constantine is that he was baptized. He waited. He didn't want to be baptized. He understood baptism, but he wanted to wait. He wanted to make sure he got it just right. So just before he died in 337, he was baptized right before his death. So very interesting beliefs and, and strange things. Now, think about that. He's taking over the church and he's not even been baptized. He's directing the church and he's not even an elder. Y'all see where this is going? All right, so this, and he's a Roman emperor. So he calls the Council of Nicaea. And there were several things they were dealing with at this council. And that was they wanted to deal with the equality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's where the idea of the Trinity comes from. That's where that term comes from. And they also were dealing with some questions about the incarnation of Jesus. Uh, they also started developing what became known as the Nicene Creed. And then they also mandated uh, things that had to do with Easter. This is where it all began. Because people was always arguing. It was like, we shouldn't do Easter. We should do Easter. It's on this day. It's on that day. And they mandated exactly what it was it wants to be. So imagine, you have all these churches that are called together by, we're going to use America, the, the president. And he says, all right, this is how we're going to do it. From now on, you guys are going to observe this holiday called Easter on this day, this way, and this is how you're going to do it. Imagine somebody telling the church that. That's exactly what happened. It was the emperor. And then, after they break up, he says, all right, all these different bishops are now in charge. This is what set the precedent for the hierarchy of bishops that we see and then starting to lead towards what became known as a head leader. Let me, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, this is the beginning of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. This is where the seeds are. So the Catholic Church likes to say, and I'm not bashing other religions, I'm just telling you what history says. The Roman Catholic Church likes to say they began on the day of Pentecost. But we could go into a whole other sermon about that. But here's your real seeds right here when this started. All right, so real quick, what's an ecumenical council? It's an assembly of church leaders that come together, and then they make rules for the church. They put out what's called edicts or bulls or decrees and different dogma that all congregations need to follow. And then they also modify the organization of the church. At each council, they wind up making some changes. Uh, first, you have bishops, head bishops, and then you have archbishops, and then you have cardinals, and then you just keep going. And it used to be the councils were the ones who made all the rules until there was a time whenever all of a sudden now the pope comes up and he makes the rules. So there's all these changes that have happened over the last uh, several uh, hundreds of years. And they also are to condemn heresy. All right. So what I want you to get out of this is what happened during the third church period, this imperial church period, the apostolic church was the pure church. And then they, they persevered during persecution. It's still the pure church, but they had a few little problems they're working out and stuff. But then you get into the imperial church and you have things like the Roman government organization have an influence on the church and even paganism and that influence on the church, and now you start to get a conglomerate of these different things that are now um, perverting the church. So then we move into the medieval church period. Now this goes from the fall of Rome. So Rome falls in 476 AD, and then this goes up to the fall of Constantinople. And I'll explain more about that fall and just a few moments, but that's the time frame. So the fall of Rome to the fall of Constantinople. So this time frame, known as the Dark Ages, the medieval period, 
This is the time whenever the church, the church universal, is overseen primarily by the Roman Catholic Church. It's also whenever you start to see these archbishops start to come up, they were called metropolitans. They had an even bigger area that they were overseeing. And so you had entire countries that now are under these metropolitan type archbishops. And then there's a struggle going on at this time for power, for supreme power between the Pope and the Emperor. You have this Emperor who is over this land, and then you have the Pope, and he's gained more power. So who has more power? I'll show you some more about that in just a second. And so there's where you start to get the development of the Pope, the Pontiff. And then eventually the Bishop, one of those bishops, those archbishops, and the one in Rome, he claims superiority over all the bishops. And that's an interesting, uh, interesting piece of history just of itself. By this time, you really get into all the cer ceremonial pomp that has to do with the way that uh, religion is done. And you have a firm clergy and laity uh, hierarchy established. You start to have the adoration of saints and, and images and arguments over that. And then instrumental music was introduced into the church for the first time in 666 A.D. And so a lot of big changes have happened in the church in this time period. The historical aspect of this is the time also when monasteries came into being, uh, the Crusades that took place, the Inquisition. This is the time of Marco Polo and Aquinas, Dante, uh, Joan of Arc. It's also the time of the rise of Islam and a very important piece of history, the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. Wish we had time to talk about all those, but you can see a lot of important history, a lot of things happened during this time that had influence on the church. Now, I've given you a lot of kind of, kind of depressing history. <laughs> Here's a simple question. Did the Lord's church continue to exist during this time? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Just because all this other stuff was going on does not mean that there weren't faithful servants somewhere that were maintaining the church. We don't know much about them, but we know that they were there. So here's that struggle for the supreme power I was telling you about. It's very interesting. Just a brief synopsis is first you have these different bishops. There was a struggle trying to figure out who's the, who's the top dog. And one of those bishops, his name was Innocent I, kind of interesting name. He declared himself to be Pope. He said, I'm the supreme. And pretty much everybody ignored him. <laughs> Nobody really listened to him, like, whatever, he just, he talks like that all the time. You're innocent, come on, right? Bad joke. Leo the, <laughs> Leo the Great, then he declared himself Pontifus Maximus. There is nobody else, and he's the first one to go back to the Bible and say, see, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, and this is where the whole idea of Peter being in Rome and then passing it down to Clement, passing it down to Linus, passing it down, passing it, passing it, passing it down till now here's Leo the Great saying, I am the Pontifus Maximus. And he does it by showing the Bible. So people are starting to pay attention. And then later you have another pope. His name was Gregory the Great. And he was quite an interesting pope. And the people wanted to make him the maximum leader. He didn't even want the title. So he's really the first one to actually serve as the Pope over the entire church universal, the Roman Catholic Church. But then Boniface III is the first one to be officially named Pope. Uh, he named himself, and then the entire church accepted it. And then last but not least, then you get into Leo III, who finally made it very, very clear that popes have the most power, not the emperors. And the way he did this is a very fascinating story. Again, I wish we had more time. Is um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, the, the king's name. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Ah, it'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, this one king that uh, whenever it was time for him to be crowned, he calls him into the room, and he comes up basically, in a long story short, he comes up behind him, and he sneaks up behind him and puts the crown on his head. and goes, I crown you king. And therefore, he can say, see, popes crown kings. That means we're more powerful than kings or emperors. And so very, very fascinating story about that. Now, has anybody ever heard this before about the popes? All right, because it's not... It's not 
very common information, but it is available, and you can find this. But this, you certainly will not find this in a lot of history books because they'll go back and try to show a different history of how these popes came about, and they don't even mention anything like this. And so, very fascinating the way that works. Thank you, Charlemagne. That's it, Charlemagne. I knew somebody would eventually save me. Charlemagne, uh, look that story up. Very fascinating story of Pope Leo III crowning Charlemagne. Another thing that happened, very important, here comes this, what we're talking about, the fall of Constantinople. There was a schism, the great schism, whenever you have this power that Constantine set up in Constantinople. He moved from Rome to Constantinople, and that's where everything was. That's where the first ecumenical council was there in Nicaea. You can see Nicaea just below Constantinople, right there. And then you have Rome. And so you got these two mega powers that are vying for power. So there's this split. And this is where you wind up with what we have today, which is the Eastern Orthodox religion and the Roman Catholic religion. They were all one, and then they split. And so you have this great schism, as what it's called. And you see up there at the top the way they looked at things. In the Eastern Orthodox side of this kingdom, if you will, the state uh, dominated, was dominated by the church. So the church really had the biggest influence on what was happening within the government of the people. Whereas in Rome, the church was dominated by the state. The, the state is the one that said how things would work. And so very interesting how, how uh, history plays out. There's those ecumenical councils. Uh, as you see, the first eight were there in the east, there in Constantinople. And then these others were in the West. And these are all the different ones over the all the way up until 1965. And they had these ecumenical councils. Again, another very fascinating, uh, worthy uh, endeavor to study that history because you'll see all these developments of all these different um, dogmas, different doctrines, and everything else. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things is that they make Mary the mother of God, elevating her above God. And so all kinds of different things that you see in there, and then official titles of popes and all the different types of doctrine. That takes us into the next one. Now you understand what I mean by the fall of Constantinople. There was a point where Constantinople finally fell, and then the Roman Empire takes completely over everything. And so you have the Holy Roman Empire. And so from the fall of Constantinople till the end of the 30 years war, very important time in history, is this reformed church period, the Reformation. And there's a lot to the Reformation. Um, so you have now uh, all these different abuses that are happening. Uh, things like indulgences, where you can pay for somebody's sin so that you can get them into heaven. And all kinds of different, you can pay uh, to be able to sin and, and not lose your place in heaven. Uh, a lot of terrible things that were taking place. Uh, and then there's only a Catholic church allowed to interpret the scriptures, not the individual. Uh, the Vulgate becomes the official Bible. And then you have also the development of this time, the Protestants. I'll explain that, what that means in just a second. Now, at this time, the Pope has begun to rule over the councils instead of the councils doing all of the ruling. And you have the development of feudalism. That's where you have these individual states, and that's where you have the knights and the kings of all these states. All You go back to the days of chivalry and things like that. That's feudalism. You have the church and the state become together. So if you have this one area... And this king decides he wants to be Lutheran, well, then everybody's going to be Lutheran. You don't have a choice. If this king over here says he's going to be Catholic, then you're all going to be Catholic. You don't have a choice. And that's how that would work a lot of times. So people started rebelling. They started dividing into different groups because they weren't going to follow what the Catholic Church was saying anymore, and they started coming up with these other ideas. As I mentioned, uh, you wind up with all kinds of different Doctrines like Mary being the mother of God, purgatory, sola scriptura, uh, the Lord's Supper is now changed completely in the way that they observe it. So worship has changed dramatically at this point. 
<clears throat> this is also the time of the Spanish Inquisition, the Wars of Religion, and lots of new Greek translations that start coming out. Of course, what sparked all of this was uh, Martin Luther's 95 Theses. He basically was fed up with the Catholic Church, and he is a Catholic priest, and he goes to what's basically a bulletin board, which are front doors of a church building where he was a professor, and they use that door like a bulletin board, and he nails on that door 95 reasons why he disagrees with the Catholic Church. And a lot of people see that as this big event that all this uproar, it would be no different if I were to walk down the hallway and put something on the bulletin board. No, nobody was really there. It was until later that a letter was sent to the Pope, and he at first brushed it off. But then they brought Luther in and asked him to respond. That's when things started to blow up. And that's what was the spark that ignited the Reformation. And so you wind up with lots of different things happening at the same time, like the word Protestant, where a bunch of German princes, these feudalistic kings, that basically were protesting against an edict made by one of those councils saying that they weren't going to tolerate the Lutherans anymore. They were Lutheran, so they protested that. And that became the name attached to anybody who is considered a denomination. There's some really famous names here. Again, wish we had time. You've got Luther, of course. You've got Wycliffe. You've got Jan Hus, Erasmus. You've got Philip Melanchthon. You've got uh, Ulrich Zwingli. John Calvin, William Tyndale, John Knox, and William Cranmer. So you have all these names. Again, great study. A lot of information. We, we owe a debt, really, to a lot of these men. Uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale. We wouldn't have these English versions that we have today if it weren't for their, their bravery. So some of these men, we need to, uh, we need to thank them. Uh, I'm not going to thank John Calvin, but the rest of them we need to thank. Uh, coming back now. We've hit five, five periods real quick, and I've only got a couple minutes left to, to talk about the last couple of hundred years, the res restored church. And that is the time of the end of the Thirty Years' War uh, to current day. So the Thirty Years' War ended in 1650. What happened with the Thirty Years' War is the Roman, let me come back to this one in a second. The Roman church has now basically gone its own way. It's completely apart from the Protestant world. You have this explosion of denominations and everything, and what winds up happening is that people, uh, w the Catholic Church winds up fighting, and they have these, these religious wars, it's basically the Catholic Church against Lutherans and, and, and all these other different people and all this bloodshed that was taking place over in, in the Europe is basically what that 30 years war was. And so coming up to the end of that, We'll add more to that in just a second is where we are today, up to this day. So when it comes to doctrine, this is where people are now trying to get back to the Bible, where it says Scripture is all sufficient, and they start to reject all the creeds and confessions of faith. Let's just be Christians only. A baptism is for salvation. This is where the phrase, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible silent comes from. Let's get back to a plurality of elders. Let's get back to autonomous congregations. Let's restore the New Testament pattern of worship. Let's have, as we see, a cappella singing. Let's take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Does all this sound familiar? This all happened 200 years ago, more, really more than 200 years ago. Um, whatever these men started coming out of denominationalism. But it's also the time when denominationalism began to rise. As people were coming to the United States. And so a lot of people think that like the Reformation period ended and then the Restoration period started. It was, it was, it was not quite as easy as that. Basically, as I said, these, you start having the Thirty Years' War and then people wanted to get away from that. So now you have the pilgrims. These people started, religious people started coming to the United States and when they landed here, they were so exhausted of all the bloodshed that basically they said, tell you what, you go over there and practice your religion. I'll go over here and practice my religion. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Is that fair? And that's where the idea of denominationalism came from. And so it wasn't because it was the best idea, denominationalism. We rail against that all the time. But that because there was no other alternative at the time in their minds. And so it's basically what Voltaire said. I don't agree with what you say, but I'll defend you to the death for your right to say it. 
And so when you come to America, now you see the rise of denominationalism because we're just going to leave each other alone and we're not going to fight and kill each other. And then they had no idea that it would turn into what we have today of more than 30,000 different churches. But before, as at the very beginning there, before we get to Alexander Campbell, a lot of people don't understand this. We had people like James O'Kelly, Abner Jones, and Elias Smith who were already doing things way before uh, Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, trying to get back to the Bible, trying to reject those creeds and everything else. And in 1794, there's a church that you can go to that they said, we're just going to be Christians. Now, they didn't have it all worked out, but the end result is what we have today is the Christian church, what really we came out of. And then, of course, you come into those people that are well-known, Barton Stone, Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, and Walter Scott. And these men all had these same ideas of, let's just get back to the Bible. And so Alexander Campbell was up in West Virginia area. You have Barton Stone in Kentucky. You have James O'Kelly in the Virginia and North Carolina area. You have Smith and Jones up in Vermont over these periods of years, all thinking the same thing. So you see this movement. Coming. Well, two of those overlapped considerably, and that was Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell. So they began to meet at where Stone was preaching at Cane Ridge, and they preached that we should abandon <clears throat> all human creeds, confessions, we should accept the Bible alone and only the Bible. And then they had this big revival. It was called the Second Great Awakening, and there were thousands, tens of thousands of people there, and that's where they began to preach Things like baptism, things like taking the Lord's Supper, uh, things like autonomous congregations. And so in 1804, they wrote what's called the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. In other words, we're putting it to death. We're not going to belong to this denomination anymore. And that's what ushered in the restoration movement that eventually led to the churches of Christ. And these people are the ones who established the churches and tried really hard not to be called Lutheran, not to be called Baptist, not to be called Methodist, but to be called what the Bible says. So you wind up having these different churches called Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, Independent Christian Churches, Churches of Christ, and so forth. And it wasn't until 1906 at the census that the first time you see an actual difference, and really what it was, it was evidence of a, of a divide that had already happened, of essentially where people who at one time had been together now disagreed primarily over instrumental music. The churches of Christ rejected instrumental music in worship, whereas the Christian church began to accept it. And they also rejected certain biblical interpretations where the others uh, did not. And so you see the separation <clears throat> of the church of Christ and the Christian church. And so that's what happened in 1906. Again, a lot more information, but a uh, very worthy study. And lastly, we have then, after the last 200 years, we have several uh, different branches of the churches of Christ, just the churches of Christ. The disciples of Christ are now their own branch, and they practice things very similar to what we do, but they have some differences. The Christian church, same sort of thing. But even within the church of Christ, you have several different beliefs that wound up being different branches of the churches of Christ. And the ones in blue there are the ones that are just have a different belief than what we do. And that is, for example, the one cup congregations. These are uh, brethren who just believe that you should not use a bunch of little cups. You should use one cup. And so if you attend a one cup church, make sure you sit on the front and the very first one, right? And so that's just what they believe. We can't fault them for what they believe. Uh, same thing with non-institutional congregations. There are brethren who believe that you should only use money for certain things, uh, that you should only uh, worship in certain ways, or I shouldn't say worship, but only have buildings that you use in certain ways. Again, this is how they interpret the Scriptures. They're matters, in my opinion, they're matters of judgment. And then you have the brethren congregations. These are, these are brethren who don't believe in a paid preacher, so they, they would not allow me. Uh, to be there. They, they believe in a rotation of men preaching at the congregations, and they base that on what they see in Scripture. And then you have, and I grew up in a, a non-class congregation, and these are congregations, brethren, 
who just don't believe in Sunday school. They think it's a denominational thing, and so they don't have all the classrooms and everything like what we have here. They only have worship service, and that's it. And it's all because of their beliefs. And notice they're in blue, because as I've studied with several people from these different backgrounds, it's like I explain it is this is how they see the scriptures. I, we can't say that they're not going to be in heaven or anything like that. This is just how they want. Is it that what an autonomous congregation is able to do? That's the way the Bible sets it up. Did Corinth have everything worked out perfectly compared to uh, Philippi? And so you have just differences sometimes of opinion, judgment. That's, that's why they're autonomous congregations. But then the ones in the red, those went off the rails. That's the Boston and Crossroads movement that eventually turned into the International Churches of Christ. And then you have the movement called A Church of Christ. And these are churches of Christ, like, for example, North Richland Hills, who now have instrumental worship. They're basically a community church, but they still like to say they are A Church of Christ. Uh, so there's lots of different things that have come out of the churches of Christ. All right. I told you that was a lot. I hope that that made sense. I don't know if you've heard all of that before. I hope you did refresh your memory or helped you understand a little bit about where some of these different churches come from. We did not have time to get into this, the timeline of, of where all the different churches come from. But you can study that at World Video Bible School and other places if you'd like. So then that brings us back to what we read in Acts chapter 2, that the Lord added to the church the assembly daily, those being saved. We just simply need to go to the Bible, follow what the Bible says. That's how I describe the Church of Christ when people ask me about it. As they were trying to do what we see in this only guide that we have. And that's what we see in history is that they got away from that for several hundred years, and then it took a long time to get back to that where we have that more now. And so the church is important. And at this time, it's really kind of a strange place to insert to insert. An invitation, but we are going to sing a song of invitation because the whole purpose of the church is to have a place that God's people can assemble. So if there is somebody here tonight who has something on their heart that they need, the prayers of the church, or if we can help you in some spiritual way, we're going to sing this song of invitation. If we can help you, please let it be known as we stand and sing.